Hello and welcome to another SDA Q&A. My very special guest today is Dr. Larry Gerrity. Great to have you here again, Larry. Thank you. It's a privilege to be with you. I love your intro. Oh, I, <laughs> it's a new I, one. <laughs> yeah, I think that's terrific. I like I like its message. You you can't hold truth down. It's that's, going to come out. That's right. Later, right. That's right. So we might that, as well. <laughs> yeah, that is a, that was my intention when I wrote that, and that's uh, a picture, a little video clip of my band playing ten years ago, up the... at uh, up at Avondale College, yeah. which is now yeah. Avondale University. Right, and uh, uh, we played there every year for thirty years, my, my. Um, until I started doing SDA Q and A, and people weren't too happy with uh, me rocking the boat, so they. Uh -huh. So here I am singing, you can't stop me now. And they did. <laughs> <laughs> but well, I in well, the larger scheme of things, they, <laughs> nobody can stop you. Uh, exactly. Truth, truth is truth and it will get out. Exactly. Yeah. And I think a healthy organization or movement or uh, any group or cluster of people n needs to not only scrutinize truth but welcome the scrutiny of truth that's true that's right that's right and that's that's an old adventist uh, custom we talk about present truth we know that truth uh, uh i don't know whether we want to say it changes but but it uh it uh various aspects of it come to the fore at different times in history and are important to us and so uh, Adventists are committed to present truth. Uh, we we don't hang on only to what's gone in the past, but we ask God what what truth is important for us now. You know, so uh, your program I think tries to emphasize those things. Yeah, yeah it does, and I'm I'm glad that you've noticed that. I appreciate that, and I I think it's such a important thing to realize that there are truths that are bound in. Uh, Mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. in uh what's a good analogy concrete <laughs> right, right. <laughs> They're deeply rooted in the soil <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but there are other things that need pruning and changing mm -hmm. and adjusting mm -hmm. and yeah right and that's yeah. definitely something i try and do on the on the program not i'm not trying to criticize people although there are criticisms that arise mm -hmm. it's really about putting a light on topics and and finding out what the truth is and in, in many ways and we've called this uh, episode which is part of a mini series within uh, season six setting the record straight mm. and we're, we're responding to an article that came out in the record which is an advent uh, an, yeah, an adventist publication here in the south pacific division mm -hmm. a brilliant uh a brilliant magazine uh, i'll bring up a um some photos of it later to show how well produced it is mm -hmm. and uh anyway a few weeks ago they released an article that was like a retrospective of uh glacier view and the, mm. the perceived outcomes of 1980 the the des ford glacier view uh big gathering that were kind of looking at some of the teachings that the des had been putting forward and not only him a lot of people were again questioning truth and looking at present truth and uh, you know just as ellen white had called people to do check these things against the bible and mm -hmm. and uh, i guess he was suggesting that some of these things perhaps weren't accurate or biblically based mm -hmm. and you were actually there at glacier view and uh right. yeah mm -hmm. so what the what was the, record... occasion, what was the occasion for the retrospective was there some kind of celebration of an Look, anniversary or something or because it seems that, a, a little strange. That is a very good question. And maybe people that are watching can um, bring up some ideas in the comments about that. I'm not too sure. I know Gillian is watching. She might uh, be able to, to share some ideas on that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that they have a series of kind of saying, hey, we were there historically uh -huh. and we reported on these things mm -hmm. and they've been doing that and it just came up to that yeah. year. And all yeah. of a sudden it was like, and we were there during this great uh, time period and we reported on this and mm -hmm. the record is always there. Mm -hmm. uh, someone's just written up that it, um, it 
uh, it was the 125 years of the record. So oh, yeah. trying to say we've been there for mm. you guys in all, all this time period. Mm-hmm. And uh, Gillian has just put up a note. By the way, if you are uh, commenting from Facebook, please put your name in the the um, the comments as Jill has done, because otherwise it comes up just as a Facebook user. And mm-hmm. Gillian has written, hi, Larry. Uh, Peter, I found the PDF of Norm's letter in black and white. Just sent it to you. A miracle. Oh, good. So I'll try and bring that letter up later, uh, which reminds me, uh, and thanks for reminding me there, um, Gillian, the record released this article essentially reproducing and re um, affirming that the the errors that were made in 1980 in the article were kind of reprinted and a lot of people are upset because we thought hang on there's been a lot of information since then sure right. reprint what you did back then but perhaps use the opportunity to say by the way we were incorrect there here's some updates to correct it Mm -hmm. and while the record didn't do that they have allowed given us the opportunity to do that and so Mm -hmm. thus the reason for you being on the show our little (laughs) mini series of setting the record straight because Uh i i think the main problem um oh i just wanted to quickly say the thank you to jillian was that reminding me that the record did allow people to send letters in and dr norm young wrote and also i think graham stacy wrote uh, a reply and a letter correcting which i think has been printed in the record so i do want to thank jared stackleroth who is the editor of the record for allowing that information to get out there so thank you Good. jared for that Good. and um so we'll read that letter from norm a little bit later and uh I think for me personally, even though there are a couple of errors there, the main thing was the article tries to say that the majority of those that were there disagreed with Greg, uh, with Des, and said that the traditional Adventist views. In fact, I'll re- I will read that little bit out. Um, mm-hmm. So it's worth getting that read correctly yes so in the article it says the majority of both groups were thoroughly satisfied that the historic positions of the church have been better have better support than the alternative positions offered and that was from the original one and also um supported in the in the look back and a lot of people so it's out as though from that uh, the way that stated is that we didn't learn anything yes and I, and I would i would take exception to that i think that there was a a broad consensus by the end but i think i think the brethren went away with a different view of what that consensus was from what the scholars did you know we we that that last day i think we felt fairly good that we had come to a consensus but it was a different consensus that those two groups came away with, I think. Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't mm. thought of that. Because I, I, my thought was that the majority did come to consensus, mm-hmm. that there was common ground. I think there was. And this think. article, and, and in fact, uh, if you look at the Ankerberg show that Bill Johnson was on in 1984, mm-hmm. he, he alludes to that. He kind of says back then... Mm-hmm. Yes, we all kind of agreed that that we wanted to. Uh, the common ground was that we didn't agree with Des. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in my recent interview with him of a couple of years ago, he said, "Actually, no, we did come to consensus, and mm-hmm. there was a consensus document, and mm-hmm. the majority did come to common ground, including Des." Mm-hmm. So, so instead of me rabbiting on, can you take us back to Glacier View? Um, and just perhaps focus a little bit on that consensus document that mm-hmm. that may have actually had a majority support. Mm-hmm. And maybe outline a little bit of, I, I know it's 43 years ago, but maybe outline a little of your memories of that time. Right. Um, and, and for those, I'll just bring it up on the, um, on the screen there, uh, just so that people know who we're talking to. This is Dr. Larry Gerrity, and you actually served as the second president of La Sierra University there at Riverside. Um, 
So you're someone that's very has been very involved within the Adventist Church, and while I'm not saying, hey, you're there as a like a journalist, photographic memory of what happened, I'd love right. you to give us a sense of what Glacier View was like, why did had it come about, and what your thoughts are on the on the consensus document. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, at the time of Glacier View, I was teaching at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary uh, at Andrews. I was in the Old Testament department, and my field of study is uh, Syro-Palestinian archaeology, or the archaeology of the Bible. And I also did uh, some work in, in Hebrew Bible, uh, Hebrew and Aramaic, and so on. And so um, that was the year, 1980, that the fundamental beliefs were uh, revised and the general conference voted a new a new set i mean not that the beliefs changed but the way they were expressed you know was was adopted and uh, my colleague and friend fritz guy was the secretary of the committee that uh, did those revisions which was assigned to the, the uh, theology professors at andrews and I was involved in helping to uh, to rewrite and to um, and to come up with with this new set of beliefs. And then, uh, when the seminary was given the opportunity to send a delegate to the general conference session, uh, the faculty voted me as their delegate. So I had the privilege of going down to um, to the general conference session and observing the way Neil Wilson, the president of the general conference, led the congregation uh, into a discussion of each of these um, doctrines as they went along. And so I suppose it was because of my involvement as a young scholar, you know, in that activity that when they, uh, they decided on this conference at Glacier View, that maybe they would include me. Now I had no, uh, and still don't have any expertise as a, uh, as a, a theologian or as a philosopher or anything like that. Uh, so uh, I was not certainly one of the key uh, discussants or one of the key individuals at that conference, but uh, I was there and I faithfully attended all of the meetings and I participated, you know, in the little groups and so forth. But I have to say that uh, when I left the mountaintop, uh, because Glacier View uh, was up very high in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, I, I just, I, I left very troubled, I have to say that. Uh, and uh, Fritz and I talked about that. And for about three weeks, for instance, Fritz didn't know whether he could serve the church any longer because he was troubled by the, uh, the attack on Des when he was very sincerely trying to help the church come to terms with the data in scripture. Uh, and <clears throat> I was of course influenced by my discussions with my peers and, and I too was very troubled and uh, uh, wrote, wrote some letters to some of the, of the general conference brethren, you know, about how I felt Des was treated and the unfairness of some of the things that, that happened. When I say that we left with a kind of a consensus, I think it was that um, we we appreciated what he what Des had called to our attention, uh, the new way of looking at things, and I thought that we had all learned from our discussion and so on. And you know, with a few things, we probably agreed to disagree, but overall, I think we felt like we'd made progress, you know, in understanding the the sanctuary doctrine. Um, and then for <clears throat> for him to lose his his uh, credentials afterwards just was very very upsetting. Um, so I, <clears throat> as I say, I was there. Um, my memory uh, dims as the as the time goes by, and I have my gut feelings that that are still with me, you know, about what happened. But I would be hard pressed to argue the facts, because uh, so much has been forgotten. And, and I have not reviewed in recent years, you know, the documents. So I'm, I'm not a good person uh, for that. But uh, um, so with, with that kind of a proviso or, or uh, 
you know, uh, confession. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Tell me what, what you'd like me to talk about. Well, I guess, uh, and thanks for what you've said there. And I, I remember in our interview that we did in season two, where there was yourself and Fritz Guy, mm -hmm. um, I really appreciated the honesty and the reflection on how you both felt after you left Glacier View, where mm -hmm. you, you did go through that time of, well, can mm -hmm. we actually be here? Mm -hmm. And and you did stay and you have, both of you have wonderfully contributed to the Adventist Church. And, um, and I think you've been able to keep reminding people that mm -hmm. hey, there's a bigger picture here. Let's let's right. keep looking at the bigger picture. Let's focus back on the gospel, mm -hmm. and, and you've both consistently done that. And by the way, um, yeah, we want to just honour Fritz Guy who passed. How long ago now is it? Is it? It was uh, the the middle of uh, of April, I believe, toward the end of April. Yeah, yeah. so it's mm -hmm. very recent, and I really. Um, valued your eulogy would you call it a eulogy or your, yeah, yeah, your tribute. Uh, tribute to to fritz it was really good it's available online if people search it they'll mm -hmm. find it so i i love i love your honesty i love the that general sense of the feeling you took away do you mm -hmm. remember <clears throat> on the friday though that there was a definite consensus there was a mm -hmm. sense of common ground written mm -hmm. written up read out and voted on Right. What are your memories of that? Because I guess the record article is suggesting that the majority did not agree with Des, did not find a consensus, and that the consensus statement they refer to in the record article was in, is inaccurately portrayed. This yeah. consensus did it was in two parts, mm -hmm. but, it, but tell me if I'm right, and and please elaborate. Mm -hmm. There was consensus on those points and even Des himself um, was heard to say that he could go along with that. Yeah, that's that's certainly my memory that the consensus statement that we came to at the end was something that we all said we could, we could agree to. Um, the mention of the 10 points was something that I don't believe we voted on. No. Uh, you know, uh, I think that uh, a smaller group worked on that, hoping that that might might help, um, but I was not involved with that effort, and so um, I can't uh, speak to it the way Norm Young can, for instance, who mm. was actively involved. And I, I have read his uh, his uh, letter to the editor after uh, the recent um, article came out in the record. But yes, we we I think we left with the feeling that we had struggled hard we have talked to each other honestly we had learned much and there was a consensus and we were grateful for the love of god that it's extended to all of us um, and nobody nobody brought that home better than does himself you know the the glory of god's grace yeah mm, yeah it, what does that say to you that there was a moment there, and I, I mentioned this in my interview with Bill Johnson, season two, episode one. Mm -hmm. I said, you guys must have gone away after that moment of the coming to kind of an agreement and finding this common ground with a lot of joy in your hearts. Mm -hmm. And, and he, you could tell on his face he, that he was, yeah, we just had so much joy and hope. Do you remember mm -hmm. that feeling yourself? I do. I do. Right. Right. Um, and I think that certainly all the scholars that I knew felt we owed Des a, a great debt of gratitude for um, for his message, which was heartfelt and grabbed us where where we needed to be grabbed. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what does that say to you that? The majority, in fact, did to come to a consensus that could agree with Des and Des with the consensus. Mm -hmm. What does that say to you that this 10-point statement was wheeled out then 
soon after and event and effectively became the the death knell to to Des's involvement in ministry within the Adventist Church eventually. Yeah, I I I don't know how that got started or why uh, that came about. Um, I wish Norm were, were here to answer that question. Um, but uh, maybe it was a, uh, a an attempt as a comeback to make sure that certain things that really hadn't been brought up mm -hmm. were brought up at the yeah. last minute. You know? Yes, yeah. We, we can't let Des get away with everything, you know. So, so let's uh, let's list a few things. That yeah, there are still problems. Maybe yeah. that. One. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll just bring up to the screen George Tishi. Hi, George. Glad that you're watching the program. Um, George has suggested that Neil Wilson had a plan and just executed it at Glacier View. Nothing but theatre. And and we're not suggesting that that's what you're saying or or me as well. But there was there does seem to have been this idea that you know we need to extract a little bit more information so that we can can politically maneuver dares out of here that's what some people think well i can i can see why because of what happened you know it, it can't have been by accident there 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 were some key players there who who uh, used and abused the process to accomplish their purposes i think we have to say that mm. And you know, a lot of people have said to me, "Let's just let this go. Let it let it die or heal. Right. Stop right. opening up the wounds." My mm -hmm. suggestion is the wounds haven't even been closed because right. they haven't been treated. And and the wonderful thing about this little mini series of setting the record straight, it's a, it's a really nice little concise way of saying, "This is what you guys have claimed happened. Here's mm -hmm. what actually happened. Now mm -hmm. let's move towards some kind of resolution." Right. Um, but I think you, it has; it will continue to come back in the public eye until it is addressed by leadership. Um, mm -hmm. That's my thought on that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, this is not maybe exactly pertinent, but um, since I come from La Sierra University, which uh, has undergone uh, in the last several years a um, an extension of its campus with uh, some available uh, farmland that wasn't needed, and we've extended the campus. And a uh, a beautiful sculpture of the prodigal son has become the sort of central focus of of this edition. And the donor who made this sculpture possible, um, it was done by a British sculptor who who taught at La Sierra, and uh, uh, quite a well known uh, man at that. But the donor was won to Christ by Dez's ministry. And so he said, I will pay for the sculpture if it is called the glory of God's grace. That is the sculpture of the of the prodigal son coming home and the father reaching out, you know, with his robes of righteousness for him and so on. And so so of course we agreed for that that would be called the glory of God's grace. And that's become the central focus of our campus a sculpture. And because that story was told in Luke uh, 15, there were two other stories in Luke 15 that Jesus told, one about the lost sheep and one about the lost coin. And so those three sculptures, we have all three now on, on campus, say to the people who come that this is the kind of institution we are. We're, we're open arms, um, no matter what the past has been for you, you know, God envelops you, accepts you, uh, loves you, and uh, and La Sierra does too, you know. And so we try to have room, room for everybody. And that all is a direct result of what Des did for this donor who uh, was so touched and moved that that's what he wanted conveyed. And so mm -hmm. in that sense... Des has had a very important influence, not only on the lives of people, but on the statuary and what it represents on campus. Wow, that's an interesting uh, story and incredible legacy that yes. that is is continuing on that Des has left behind there. 
I like what you said earlier that Des had the ability to grab you with, right, right. with his uh, passion and convictions and message. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll I'll bring up the um, the Des uh, sorry the Norm Young letter, and okay. Julian has just said it to me in a format that I think I can bring onto the screen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm I'm realizing just as, as a quick glance here that the article that came out uh, that features his letter is slightly different to the actual letter. Naturally, they've just kind of taken part mm. of it. And so I will read both. I'll read the the um, original letter that he wrote to them, the, to the editor, and then I'll read um, what I can bring up onto the screen and we'll hopefully get all the technical stuff right um so i can't bring up the actual letter i'll just read that it's only three paragraphs Mm -hmm. and then i'll bring up the article slash letter uh and uh, forgive me for my croaky voice i've just spent 10 wonderful days up at the gold coast with my two little girls and family and there were 25 of us up there 13 children 12 adults at SeaWorld and uh, we went to movie land and wet and wild and went on roller coasters and had a brilliant time. Wow. Spent a lot of my time calling out. <laughs> so that's, that's the croaky <laughs> voice. But uh, those that are watching, uh, my apologies for not having our interview last week. That's where I was on the Gold Coast here in Australia in sunny Queensland. So this is the actual letter, I'll read it out, that Norm wrote in his <laughs> response to the recent record article <clears throat> that we think had an opportunity to correct some of these um, errors that were perpetuated. Uh, okay, to the editor. The article about Glacier View was unexpected, uh, in brackets, featured August 26. I think it is time for us to face the fact that 1844 has little place in the practical life of the average Adventist. It is near impossible to maintain the fervent excitement of the early Adventists beyond the 19th century. Any attempt to do so simply perpetuates the great disappointment. I was part of the small group at Glacier View that authored the so-called 10-point statement. I was responsible for only 02 and uh, he quotes what that was. The Day of Atonement in the Epistle to the Hebrews, uh, the point two affirmed the fulfillment of the Day of Atonement in the first century through the death of Jesus. Dr. Desmond Ford agreed with this position. I know this because I gave him my draft to read before I submitted it. Another committee of mainly administrators composed the following paragraph. So they've added to this point two. But we do deny that his entrance into the presence of God, one, precludes a first apartment phase of ministry, or two, marks the beginning of the second phase of his ministry. And Norm goes on to say, the independent nature of this paragraph is indicated by the sudden shift from the third person, there is also general acceptance, to the first person, but we do deny The affirmation of the two-apartment ministry of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary was also not part of the original point two. I did not author this paragraph, and in fact, it is not only contrary to the rest of my point two, but it also opposes the consensus document that was unanimously supported by the delegates on the Friday morning. Since I affirmed Dr. Ford's views on the letter to the Hebrews, I feared my point two would be mutilated by a subcommittee. So I persuaded him to accept my final sentence, namely, this is an unwarranted reduction of Adventist belief. This lacked candor, and I regret this sentence profoundly now. In fact, I tried to have it modified on the Friday morning of the conference. The 10-point statement was never voted on and was never intended to be used as a test of orthodoxy. Its misuse for this purpose is indefensible. Yours faithfully, Norman Young. So that's a very powerful letter to the editor there. And again, I just want to thank the record for uh, allowing Norm's letter to be uh, reprinted in the 
in the record, but as I said, it differs a little bit to that. So let's bring up the record version of that. And it looks like I might have to read it. Can you see that your end? I can't, but maybe others can. Let's try again this button. There you go. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Boy, I'm glad I noticed that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so it's it's a little bit hard to see there, so I will have to read that again. Mm -hmm. um, apologies for those having to just listen to my voice. Oh, I can enlarge it. Oh, that's good. That's uh, better. Let's see how big. It is. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Is that, is that readable? Yes, it is. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. So let's. I might even try one more thing. There we go. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I will read that as well. Mm -hmm. Eyewitness response. As a participant at the 1980 Sanctuary Review Assembly at Glacier View, I feel I should make a few clarifications in response to some of the comments in Have Your Say, April 1. <clears throat> okay, so it looks like he was given two opportunities here. One, he wrote the letter to the editor, which I just read. And then they said to him, would you like to further clarify that, which I think he's done here. So I'm so glad I've got the original to compare with this. Right. Uh, this will be slightly different. Um, okay. I feel I should make a few clarifications in response. First, the gathering of scholars and administrators at Glacier View did not function as a trial. So terms such as courts of judgment, guilt, innocence, and evidence are inappropriate. Second, the result of this intense review of the sanctuary teaching was the unanimously voted statement titled Consensus Document, Christ in the Heavenly Sanctuary. This is a very Christ-centered, fresh expression of our belief on this matter. No one is condemned in it, and it is no mere repetition of fundamental belief 23, now 24. Third, it's best to avoid Johann X technique, by which he tried to damn Luther at the uh, Leipzig debate 1519 by associating him with the condemned uh, Jan Hus. A.F. Ballinger must be assessed on his own merits or faults, but the views of all others should be heard independently of him, especially when they differ considerab considerably from his teachings. Fourth, the doctrines of the righteousness by faith and sanctification were never part of the discussion at Glacier View. In fact, we were instructed that they were not an issue. The new statement is very emphatic that the free gifts of grace and forgiveness bring the believer into the new ethical life of the resurrected Jesus. Paul is unmistakably clear on this in Romans 5, 6, Ephesians 4, 1 to 6, 17 to 5, 2. Even so, some thought that he approved of evil, Romans 3, 8, and made Jesus an assistant of sin, Galatians 2, 18. We should be cautious that we do not make the same error and condemn someone of denying sanctification when they do no such thing. Fifth, along Although the doctrine of creation was not an issue at Glacier View, I'll give a personal pastoral opinion. Provided all other conduct is faithful to the Christian ethos, I leave it to the individual how she or he integrates their learning with their faith. If some read a section of scripture and poetry as a pastor, I do not feel I should threaten him or her with expulsion unless they read it as scientific prose. More importantly than an apology are the words of Jesus about forgiveness, Mark 11 to 25, and reconciliation, Matthew 5, 23, 24. And in neither case does Jesus mention a prior repentance, Norm Young. Mm. What are your thoughts on that? Well, he, he, he certainly was there, and he was one of the key players, and he was both a friend of Des and a faithful student of the Word, trying to help the church uh, through this uh, crisis of, uh, of, you know, misunderstanding and condemnation, uh, and try to, to be fair to all people concerned and come up with something that could be truly a consensus so that we could move on, you know, in the spirit of the gospel. So um, I, I've always admired Norm and believe that um, 
uh, he has a lot of credibility because of who he is, what he's taught, his knowledge of the scriptures, his knowledge of the Greek, and uh, his life of service. So, yeah, I would say uh, he's got to have the last word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, I am hoping to get him to do a little uh, interview on setting the record straight as well. That'd be good. He's, um, his health is failing. Yeah. But he's still very with it, and uh, I, I often bump into him around town. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad we had the actual letter there that that he wrote right. to the editor too, because that is a little bit firmer in its um, uh, in its wording. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so thanks again to Jarrell, Jared Stackelroth, the editor of the record, mm -hmm. for allowing Norm to have a a reply there. Mm -hmm. Now, in the in the comments and the chat there, you can see it kind of going along the side. Are there any that you'd like to address? Well, I I, I haven't specifically been following the no the, uh, I, comments, um, but I would I would say that that with regard to the doctrine, um, it seems to me that. 18, we, with what happened in 1844, we just have to say that we admit we got it wrong. You know, we we misinterpreted scripture in the in our enthusiasm at that time for something that was timely and for, with a historist approach that we inherited from William Miller and so on. Uh, people got caught up in date setting, even though we know that Jesus said, "No man knows the day or the hours." So I think. I think the honest thing is just to say we were mistaken mm -hmm. and we were sorry for that. But the group that gathered together uh, then in anticipation of Jesus coming felt that they had something in common that they didn't want to lose. And mm -hmm. so they, 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 they continued, you know, to study the scriptures and to do their best and to find an explanation. What, what did we get wrong? What happened? And so on. So, Let's let's be honest that that we misinterpreted scripture. We made a mistake, but we had something going for us, and uh, um, we valued that. And as we have shared our enthusiasm for what we learned, uh, the church has grown and has been blessed. And we owe a lot to Ellen White and to her husband and to the other pioneers at that time for the grounding that they gave us in, in scripture. That's not to say they didn't make, continue to make mistakes or didn't get it all straight, but the outcome has been good. Uh, so let's not try to explain something <laughs> that doesn't work yeah. or, uh, or misinterpret scripture and twist it to make us say, this was good or right all along, you know. I, th I think that we just have to be honest and move on. That's not to deny that God isn't blessing, that we don't have a wonderful church, that uh, we're doing a lot of wonderful things around the world, but we did make a mistake in the beginning. We just have to admit it. Mm, I agree. Well said. Do you think, I know um, when I was kind of... Uh, Reaching, reaching my adult years in mm -hmm. the Adventist church, there was a sense of hope. Jan, mm -hmm. Paul, Jan Paulson was the president mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. And there was a sense of, hey, things are changing. We're going to move towards this kind of um, admission of we were wrong. Let's right. deal with it, move on. There's lots of good things to embrace. Mm -hmm. And I think you you would agree that that climate was kind of seemingly starting to expand. It was. Do you think, um, it's interesting with Ted Wilson, the son of Neil Wilson, there seems to be almost like a, a return to the Neil Wilson days and the Pearson days where they are wanting to not allow this questioning of Ellen White's authority to take place. They don't want to admit that there was error in the 1844 belief. Mm -hmm. Are you... Um, tempted to feel a little bit despondent like you did as you left Glacier View mm -hmm. as you see the current political climate within the church? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that um, in individuals who are stuck in the past have 
um, had the upper hand in terms of interpreting Adventist doctrine. Uh, they've continued to use the historist approach. They have neglected what the true meaning of the script, scripture is, the best interpretations, and have uh, locked us in to something that is indefensible. Um, and the Biblical Research Committee that is sponsored by the General Conference has on it only those who believe, you know, in the traditional uh, way and does not include a representative cross-section of scholars in the church. So um, we're, I would say, in a wilderness period of our church history, waiting for the windows to open again, to let in God's spirit, to lead us in what's present truth and what he wants us to do now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. The, a wilderness period. Mm -hmm. um, in the interview I did with you in season two and Fritz Guy, you said something which you, which kind of permeates everything that you do and say, which I really value about your contribution to humanity, not just Adventism, uh, this sense of inclusivity. And we mm. talked about uh, my feeling that the there was an us and them, the more traditional historicists were saying, unless you believe this, you're out, mm. which was kind of exemplified with Glacier View. Mm -hmm. Post Glacier View, there was many ministers were like, you know, you're either, they were, Ford became the line in the sand. You're a Fordite, you're out. Mm -hmm. um, in the interview I did with you and Fritz, you mentioned that you'd like to kind of see the fence be uh, extended to include both the historic Adventists and the more liberal progressives. And we're all able to kind of join together in fellowship. I think Bill Johnson calls it the big tent kind of right. point of view. Right. And right. I agree with that and love that too. Though many of us feel that the the wilderness period that perhaps followed after Glacier View and is upon us once again can never ever end within Adventism. Mm -hmm. um, Rose Power has just written, um, "Will the church be able to admit error?" And mm. and perhaps my thoughts would be that I don't, me personally, I don't think it ever is going to, um, it, it, it will offer times where it appears that we're coming out of the wilderness, but mm -hmm. at some point every 30, 40 years, the wilderness um, is upon us again. What, and, I, and I'm not asking this in any questionable way or criticism at all but what gives you a hope that there can be an end to the wilderness and that maybe the church as a bigger body will find this time of inclusivity that many many adventists have yearned for mm. what what gives you hope well i think i think you know christ is our savior he's our leader and uh to the extent that we uh allow him to, to, to lead and we follow his example um, and we commit ourselves to inclusion of all who he has created, um, recognizing that there'll be some disagreements along the way, but we can learn best together when we're not fighting these uh, separatist battles and struggles, but saying, if you want to be a part of the family, please come in. We want to learn from you. We want you to be a part of the journey. And together, let's listen to where Christ is calling us and to how he wants us to treat one another in, in his family, you know? And with that kind of a spirit, I think that we would continue to grow we would reflect his, his, uh, his glory, his desire for humanity. And um, I think life would be very rewarding and exciting because we're not, we're not fighting cultural battles. We're not looking to divide the sheep for the goats. That's, that's God's 
God's work. It's not ours. Ours is to proclaim the good news that goes to everyone who wants to respond. So uh, I live in a community where I've, I sense that's what's happening. You know, La Sierra, Loma Linda, Southern California. Uh, people are not raising barriers to participation. They're saying, come on in. We want to learn from you. We want you to be part of God's family. And so to that extent, I think the uh, brethren in Silver Spring are becoming less and less relevant to what God is doing in the world. And their focus is on saving the structure and protecting our flanks and making sure that nobody will allow science to influence us uh, or uh, anything that might change our views. Uh, and I, I have no desire to for those people to leave because I'd like to learn from them. But I think that they might well learn from some of the others of us who have something to share, something to teach also. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well said. I've, I've heard um, people say that California is like a, another country, not part of the United States. <laughs> is La Sierra a little bit like another denomination, not really part of Adventism? Well, I would like to think that it's uh, it's truly historic Adventism. You know, we, we our roots go back to uh, the 1850s when, uh, when Adventism moved west. Um, and Ellen White kept moving to Australia so she could practice what God called her to, to do, you know, without the brethren sort of looking over her shoulder and insisting that she do certain certain things. So California has always been a kind of a frontier as far as the United States is concerned. It's it's a fresh, fresher, uh, people are willing to try new things, not do things necessarily the old way. Uh, it's a very diverse society. We're the most diverse, you know, um, culturally, ethnically, of the United States. And so that means that uh, we're a uh, cross section of the, of the whole wide world here in the, in the West. So it does have certain, certain advantages. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, politically, we tend to be more open uh, than uh, back East or, or in the South of the country. But uh, that doesn't mean we're perfect. We don't have lots to learn. So I think we need each other, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I like that. Um, when, it, but just prior to lockdown, the autumn council or the annual council, mm -hmm. uh, where the, I think 2019, the compliance document kind of came mm -hmm. into policy. Mm -hmm. I, remember, I remember then the next year they had, um, six of the unions were warned mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they were told that they had one year to turn things around with regards to women's ordination and a few other things, Norway, mm -hmm. North American division too, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember Jan Paulson in tears, you know, right. Ted don't go ahead with this. And Ted mm -hmm. said, well, you guys voted for it last year. Mm -hmm. um, so here it is, deal with it. Then lockdown hit and it kind of watered down the next year the ability to kind of go from warning to reprimand to sanctions, I understand, are the three steps. Right. Where are we at with that now? Like, ha have they had the Autumn Council where the Norwegians and the NAD have been brought back in, on <laughs> into trial and ha where they get to say we have changed or we haven't? Where are we up to with that? You know, I, I'm not aware that it was brought up again. Yeah, I, I couldn't I, find I, it. Oh, I, th I think that uh, the brethren have lost that battle. 
and recognize that uh, they will only split the church if they in, insist on that. Mm. And so I think uh, uh, better better judgment has prevailed, and they've decided just not to to pursue that anymore. I mean, Im imagine cutting off the Pacific Union, mm. cutting off uh, the Columbia Union. Uh, I mean, much of the of the resources that r the General Conference is able to run with or run on comes from these unions. And so they need not only our money, but they need our our uh, our presence, our our institutions, and so on. And so rather than splitting the church, I think they've decided that, they just have to give that up as a mistake and, and move on. But they haven't admitted it. They haven't said that. They've just ignored it. That's know? right. It's just kind of just disappeared. Right. Uh, right. I, I, I kind of scoured all the, the <laughs> meetings to try and find it and couldn't. I yeah. can't even find anywhere online. And you used to be able to look up the compliance document and the six points that right. came into policy. Right. Do, do you have your hands on that link? I cannot find that even anymore. I don't. I don't. Mm. You know, uh, one of your uh, countrymen, I don't know, David Trim, whether he's Australian or not, but he certainly has roots there. Uh, he's the head of the archives at the General Conference, and he could certainly lay his hands on them for you and, and get them. A uh, very, very capable person who's doing a good job, um, you know, with the uh, with the archives. Um, but uh, so I'm sure they're available, but uh, yeah. no, I, I don't, I wouldn't know how to get a hold of them oh. other than to approach the GC archives. I have a lot of uh, very helpful viewers. So if you're watching, and I think <laughs> Gillian, Gillian might be friends with his, with David Trim's mother. So I'm sure. I'm sure. Those, those watching out there, find me the link to the, <laughs> I, I found link to the talk of the policy and general overviews, but I want the six right. clients document policy orders. That's the job for those watching. <laughs> now, look, I've so enjoyed our conversation today. And what I thought we'd do is just quickly bring up, I'll just go through some of the questions and comments. Uh -huh. and you can comment or just say, yep, well, that's a statement or whatever. Take that as a, take that as a statement. Uh, or respond if you like. I'll just bring up a few, yeah. and then we'll close off with with perhaps give us a sense of, um, and you kind of have already, but this sense of hope. We're in the wilderness, but I'll offer us at the end some kind of way out of the wilderness for those that want to remain in the church. Mm -hmm. I, I've discovered that even leaving the church, um, that doesn't mean you have to leave the camaraderie and and i certainly enjoy our conversation and and i i wish we lived near each other and i could say hey let's catch up for a yeah. uh, go and have a a chai latte or something yeah, right okay. uh right. i enjoy the camaraderie that still exists for me mm -hmm. um so i think it's there's a bigger picture isn't there there's a picture that you can step back even from saying hey we're adventists and we want to include historicists and liberal progressives yeah. there's another step back you can go well let's try and accept broader communities as well right, right. in this fenced off area <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so uh jillian wrote this one i'm not sure if all of it comes up on the screen we'll see um interestingly the first letter peter read out this is the norm young one mm -hmm. earlier is the one norm sent to me for approval <clears throat> i don't agree with some of the things he said in the one in the record which i hadn't seen it is crazy to say it wasn't a trial it was a trial norman wasn't in the room i could i could say more mm -hmm. um so <laughs> norm doesn't have the last one <laughs> um yeah. so thank you Gillian. ray ray there is no heavenly sanctuary jesus ended heaven itself not a building mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh this is facebook user not sure who said this i'm just quickly scrolling down we can't ellen white said she saw you oh yeah this i think mark anthony might have said this yes mark yeah. anthony um and i think he's addressing uh, we were talking about can they ever um, right. Right. Uh, admit to this error and he's highlighting an interesting point there ellen actually said she saw jesus entering the most holy place um in heaven 
So is that a reason why the church maybe at its core can never really admit the error because Ellen's claim is such a prophetic one? Jesus, God, whispered in her ear and said, no, no, let me show you what happened. And here we are. I, I entered the most holy place in October 22, 1844. By, by saying it was an error, are we saying that Ellen White is perhaps a false prophet? You know, I think that, that Ellen is using figurative language. Uh, she was a very spiritually minded person. Uh, she had dreams. Um, she, she pondered on these things a great deal. And uh, she saw herself in situations that, um, that of course, she, was, she, she wasn't there. I mean, this, this was in her dream. This is what she was thinking about when she went to bed and when she woke up in the middle of the night and so on. And so she shares those experiences with us. Um, and we can learn from them, but we cannot we cannot uh, make them walk on all fours, so to speak. You know, often. Hmm. Yeah, I guess. Um... We, we're, in other words, this is not. There's not a lesson to be learned in heavenly geography. You know, in the arrangement of the buildings there, and the rooms. <clears throat> I mean, all of that is is talk that that we're used to but we have no idea what what haven't what's, mm. what's in heaven she may have misinterpreted what she was being shown perhaps and and it was more figuratively given to her but was her takeaway that that william miller was right and 1822 something did happen would she have gone to her grave believing the visions the way she interpreted them i think i think so right i think i think but let's remember that uh, we have to remember time place and circumstance when we're interpreting the past you know and we can't 200 years later believe exactly the same thing that they believed at her time we've, we've learned a lot more mm. you know about the earth about the universe i mean look at the hubble space mm. telescope and, and the more recent ones the vastness of the universe you know mm. so we we have to be very humble because we know so little and mm. we can't be dogmatic about mm. you know, <laughs> heavenly geography mm. uh, <laughs> and we touched we touched on those things in the interview with yourself and Fritz Guy in season two. I can't remember what number it was. I'll post it in the comments later. It's a fascinating interview. I'd encourage everyone to go and watch it. Uh, but we, we touched on those things. And I loved the, the way when you and Fritz talked about it, your eyes lit up in not, not to go, oh, we're scared of this, but in awe of these new discoveries of science. Right. And I loved Fritz touched on... Um, and I think I said in the interview, or oh, let's get you back to talk more about that, about this notion of the imminent return of Jesus as well, mm -hmm. um, that, that perhaps Adventism has misunderstood that. Mm -hmm. It occurs to me that in every movement eventually polarizes, and there's those who will take it figur figuratively or literally, and, and those who go a little bit more metaphorical, but they, mm -hmm. in some weird way, they need to dance together. <laughs> Um, to, we, to, we need each other. We can learn from each other. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's no question about yeah. that. Yeah. I'll bring up a comment. Uh, this is Lowell Tarling. I'm not sure if you know Lowell. I, he know, wrote, I know the name, but I don't yeah. think I know him personally. Mm -hmm. He wrote that uh, great book, Edges of Adventism. Did I get that mm -hmm. right, Lowell? Edges of Adventism. I've read it several times. Uh, brilliant book. Um, uh, power was centralized. I think he's talking now about glacier view let's just double check many church employees theologians and pastors were afraid to lose their jobs along with their superannuation so they rationalized it and with des out of the way some lesser lights even got promoted many mm -hmm. others um, talented people stuck to their beliefs got dropped or dropped out it's sad for them but good for the wilson dynasty or dynasty as we say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and just reading through thanks for your patience everyone as i scroll through the many comments and <laughs> that's wonderful to see um someone's talking about some of ellen's borrowing but that's a whole other conversation 
Uh, no, who wrote this? No GC president is willing to bell the cat. Mark Anthony. Well, is that a term I'm not familiar with? Bell the cat? Um, George Tishi has written, I moved to Reno six months ago, but I'm still a La Sierra citizen. <laughs> I used to see him on a regular basis. Oh, but, right. Oh, that explains what's Why? happened. Why? Yeah. Uh, we're going to have George on the program at some point. Mm -hmm. um, Ma G has written, E.G. White was exiled to Australia, <laughs> but she would not let go of uh -huh. uh, Wing in charge. Not sure. Thank you. Um, Rose Power, who was until recently um, running the, the archives and heritage centre here at Avondale. People in power unconsciously need followers, not partners. So they hide what they're doing to keep that power. It's often true. Yeah. Um, and this looks like a little bit off course here. David Kincaid has written, Stephen Beagle's the 20, 60 days, 42 months is a more important prophecy. Okay, it's, that's, sorry, that's another. There's often the comments have Sure. Uh, sub conversations, which I love. It's great. Right, right. Um, someone has written. Uh, this is Angela. Hi, Angela Lima. Of course, Ellen had to have a vision to legitimize the IJ. <laughs> uh -huh. well, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, no. you know, when she, when, when the brethren came to her with questions and when we, she was thinking about issues that were of concern and so on, then of course she, she uh, dwelt on those and had ideas about those things and probably read about about those uh, some of those related issues in history and so on. So it all melded together. And uh, a prophet is a prophet for one's time, yeah, you know, you're, exactly. you're a leader. And so the things that exercised her and were important in her environment and so on, she spoke to. And some of the principles that that she enunciated continue to be helpful to us, but a lot of the particulars are are for another era that need not concern us. Yeah. Uh, actually, um, thank you to Gary Chartier. Is that pronounced correctly? Chartier. Mm -hmm. Chartier, um, who helped pull this interview together. So thank yes, you so much, good. Gary. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd love to get you back on again at some point, Larry, just so we can chat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's just written and said, belling the cat. And now, of course, I know exactly what it means. Yeah. Uh, it's mice will all agree they need to put a bell on the cat to warn them of the proximity problem. <laughs> yeah, I do know that. <laughs> Course. You know, Gary, Gary would be a wonderful guest for you to have. I, I'm definitely he's, having Gary on very, very well later. Yeah. He's an author with uh, 20 some books, you know, and uh, published, and he knows something about everything. So uh, I, I cannot partner. <laughs> I cannot wait to have Gary on the program in the next week or two. Uh, he's also written that he knows David Trim um uh, really likes and respects him mm -hmm. um i i've often wondered and I'm, i think gary might agree that he does have this kind of more conservative streak about him that um he he i've heard podcasts with him where he veers into being an adventist apologist a little bit right. too more energetically and passionately than i would like <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's, uh, let's remember where he works. Yeah, uh, exactly. For him to be effective. <laughs> I've invited him on the show and he resoundingly said no. Uh, uh, I, I think he, he doesn't want me to kind of ask quirky <laughs> questions. <laughs> uh, Ma, Ma G has written, either E.G. White was a true prophet of God or she was not we can't waffle back and forth between dreams and what she may have meant um and she adds she did not misinterpret and i think what one thing you said larry that's very important that i think adventists need to come to terms with prophets 
every single prophet has been a prophet for their time. That's right. No, no prophet has an, had an ongoing authority. <laughs> right. And right. I think if you can put Ellen White in that stance, then it mm -hmm. is open for people to interpret what she said back mm -hmm. then, whether it was accurate or not. But mm -hmm. I would agree with Margie that if we keep her in, uh, we, uh, if the Adventists keep her as an ongoing authority and a prophet for these times, mm -hmm. it, you, you then, it, it then becomes murky. And it's a bit. Uh, I hope Margie's not saying that a prophet can't make a mistake. You no, know? I, I think what she might be saying, and I might, I might be incorrect in interpreting her, that one, a prophet can be a true one or a false one. And if it did yeah. turn out that Ella White was a false prophet, even back in her day, mm -hmm. that would surely, if, if you found out for sure Ellen White was a false prophet, would mm -hmm. that temper your view on the positivity you see and hope for the Adventist church? Yeah, I, I, I see Ellen White as, as, as a very human prophet, but a very important prophet for what has happened in the Adventist church. We, we wouldn't be where we are today without her guidance, you know, in education, in health, in administration, in education. Uh, we, we, we just owe her so much, but uh, that's not to say that she didn't make mistakes. And it's not to say that we can be content with everything that she said now we've moved on you know we live in a new world one that she didn't anticipate and she would be the first i think to say that and to recognize that if she were among us mm -hmm. um sorry wrong one um angela lima has written prophets cannot make mistakes on prophecy uh one one unfulfilled prophecy renders the prophet false and for me personally uh and this shows how inclusive and accepting you and i can be of each other i personally do think she was a false prophet and so therefore i couldn't be a part of the church but that's no judgment in the slightest for those who disagree with me on that and um i think the true prophet can make it can make a mistake it can have a false prophecy. Yes, I, I think true. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and and we'll come to learn that you know. That. And um, and I think if someone is a true prophet or a false prophet, because of their human nature, of course mm -hmm. they're going to make mistakes and right. flawed humans and whatnot. For me, and I think Angela might be in the same camp as me on this one. I, mm -hmm. I've come to the conclusion that she was a false prophet. So mm -hmm. for me, I couldn't um, continue being an Adventist, but I enjoy the camaraderie of Adventists and I have no problem with people saying, oh, you're wrong, Pete. I think she was a prophet, but we, mm -hmm. we realize that, you know, she was for her time. And, and so mm -hmm. I listen to what you say and I think, oh, wow, I'd love to be in La Sierra and uh, I'd come along to all the meetings. <laughs> Well, uh, pe people like you are good for the church. We need you. Uh, and there's no reason to say, in my view, that you're not an Adventist. I think I think that you are. And we, ne we need you. We need your questions. Uh, we need your um, probing, you know, because otherwise we'll go astray. So we, we need each other to succeed in life. Mm. We can't have people who are just saying all the same thing. Exactly. Uh, yeah, that's so true. It's he a healthy environment to have people that disagree. Right. I think uh, uh, it might be a Japanese, and I look totally wrong here going off my memory, which is very, <laughs> very fallible. <laughs> uh, I think in Japanese culture, they might have a term called the red horse and mm -hmm. various corporations always have someone that is designated the red horse and their job yeah. is uh -huh. to prod and probe and ask questions and criticize the, the current the conservatively right. held beliefs and right. and and they do that because of the importance of stimulating we call it stirring the pot as if it's negative but i think it's a very healthy thing, very to, healthy thing. Yeah. Right. Right. 
Um, I'll just bring up another couple of comments and then we'll wrap up. Stephen Beagles has written, we stand on Ellen's shoulders and we see further. Yeah. <laughs> Stephen and I don't agree on this, but um, I love having Stephen's comments. Um, I, I like that. I like what he's saying that they stand on her shoulders, but we can see farther because she was she wasn't where we were at. She lived a hundred, you know, fifty years ago, one hundred fifty years ago. So she couldn't see what we see now. If she could, she would obviously have have a message that would be more timely and more pertinent. Mm. Her, her message, her pertinence, was to the nineteenth century. You know. Yeah, and I'll just let Gillian have the last word of our comments mm -hmm. uh, because we're bringing it back to Dares and Glacier View. And I'm just Good. looking around because I've got the actual manuscript, the original one here somewhere in reach, uh, and she has mentioned um, that Adventists have a wrong view of what a prophet is. Des mm -hmm. wrote about this in the Glacier View manuscript. It's a fundamentalist position that prophets are always correct in what they say uh vis-a-vis -vis john the baptist and all and all of them really mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so uh, yeah it's it, uh Deza's view of ellen would probably align with with yours and he mm -hmm. wrote in that manuscript did. did you did you read the manuscript before glacier view did you have time to read I, the famous almost thousand page yes i i can't say that uh I read it from beginning to end. I can't say that I read it carefully every single page, you know, but there were part there were parts that I would slow down and were a special interest and other parts that I went more quickly, but I, I did try to be a, a worthy participant. In the mm. And I'm not sure that many of the brethren did that, but Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think they took their cues from uh, their leaders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What a fascinating time period, uh, bookending in some ways your career, the Ted right. Wilson and the Neil Wilson era, right. the, the Glacier View, the, the current po politics with the compliance document. There's this kind of desire from Adventist leadership to really control the masses uh, right. in a way that, that, like you say, thrusts people right. into the wilderness, suppresses others, creates tension um and yeah to for you to have been there and witness that event so that, i think bill johnson and i've heard others call it uh the the greatest event since 1888 within adventism mm -hmm. and would you agree with that i would i would um it was a, a very crucial time you know the, the wilsons are very very able family and um, I, I my teenage years were spent in the Middle East when Elder Wilson was the president of the Egypt or the Nile Union and so Ted Wilson is 10 years exactly 10 years younger than I am so um, when he came to seminary he actually lived with my parents so you know there's there's been a close relationship through the years between the Garrity's and, and the Wilson's but um, uh, so I actually Neil Wilson uh, spent a day trying to talk me into be president of Loma Linda University in in 1990. Uh, so I mean that shows that he, even though we cross purposes, we were at cross purposes several times. Yet he he was also a, a man who could uh, who could forgive and forget. Not always. But in my case, you know, he he saw something in me that he continued to uh, to, uh, to to relate to me in a positive way. Um, I don't know whether that's true of his son or not. We haven't had much to do with each other for a long time. But, uh, God can use us all, you know, in His work, despite our mistakes, as long as we're willing to uh to learn and grow and change along the way mm. i like that story because you many would see neil wilson and yourself as quite right. oppositional right. but here's a moment where he's saying hey i want you to be president yeah. 
And he was he was that way with Roy Branson, for instance. You know, Roy grew up also in the Middle East, where his dad uh, was an, an administrator, and so there was a special relationship between Roy and and Neil. Uh, they often were at cross purposes, but there was something in that relationship that sustained them both, and mm -hmm. so. Uh, for a long time, you know, when when Roy edited Spectrum and, and was critical of the GC and so on, he would get into trouble with Neil. But Neil still saw him as one of his boys, in a sense, you know, and, and tried to uh, try to maintain a friendship. So I have... I have respect for, for our brethren at the General Conference who are trying to lead a world church and doing their best to keep people together. Um, I think that uh, I think they fail as often as they succeed, but uh, who are we to throw stones, right? <laughs> I, um, I quite, I don't agree with Ted Wilson on, right. I think, every possible belief or claim right. that he right. has, right. but I do like that he presents clearly what he thinks so right. you can easily choose to agree or disagree that's true i i quite like that kind of person i don't like people mm -hmm. where i'm going what did, what are they really saying i'm right. not too right. sure um i just a quick aside someone has written and talked about doug hackleman who wrote mm -hmm. that book who watches who Cares, yes. is that the one yes. who is also writing a book on Ray Cottrell. What do yes. you say, Cottrell? I, I've heard some Cottrell. 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 Yeah, yeah. Cottrell. Um, that yes, would be no, very that interesting. Has, has, he has a has a wonderful store of material about Cottrell, and Cottrell was one of the key figures in the church who's, who hasn't gotten his due, you know. But will when yeah. Doug finishes the manuscript, and so I hope that that's coming along well. Yeah. Yes, so that I wanted to just raise Ray's name because he and Des, in many ways, were kind of. I yeah. think I think did Ray speak a month earlier at the Spectrum Forum, saying almost identically what Des had said. I think so. Somehow mm -hmm. it just kind of right, and, and right. that's why I liked what you said. Des had the ability to grab you, right. so Des might have said the same thing. It mm -hmm. grabbed your attention, but it also got the the attention of the powers that be that we're like we're going to draw a line in the sand here <laughs> Dead, right, we're going right. to get you brother <laughs> yeah. um look let's we've, we've got um mrs faye is watching from barbados it's now oh 9 30 p.m over there that's oh great my. faye she's just also <laughs> written that this last sabbath in church was so burdensome listening to the pastor preaching the adventist doctrinal errors oh my. and and this interview we've we've we thank the record, uh, Jared Stackelroth, a for allowing uh, Norm Young and Graham Stacy to reply mm -hmm. and give their thoughts and corrections on the the previous record mm -hmm. article that we feel needed to be corrected, and we 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 don't know why they wrote that, but it has given us an opportunity to really just set the record straight. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, we're, we're very thankful for being able to do that today. Uh, one last one here from, uh, this is Phil Curry. Mm -hmm. And uh, Phil has worked at very high levels within the Adventist Church over here, uh, running the Sydney Adventist Hospital for a time. Mm. And so I thought I'd bring up what he said because this is very true. Uh, mm -hmm. De Bono or De Bono uh, influence corporate culture by promoting six hats of thinking. In other mm. words, companies needed to consider matters from many perspectives before decision making. The black mm. hat was considered the most important. It challenged the status quo um, uh, and the mainstream thinking. Agree that contrarian thought is an important part of a debate to find truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll just let Margie have last i said jillian and there's someone else and we've got lots of last says here if god whispered in her ear and told her what to say wouldn't that hold true for all time and not just during her era me thinks that the church is making lame excuses for ellen g white 
You know, I, I would say that we each live in our own time and place with our own issues. And um, so I can see, uh, and, and I think that's why we need new prophets. You know, we can't be content with prophets from another age. Uh, we give them their due. We thank them for their contribution, for the way they led at the time that they lived. But who is our prophets today? I mean, Adventists believe in the spirit of prophecy, which means that we need prophets. We need people speaking to our own time. And I think that's a challenge to our young people. Which, which of you is going to be the prophet that speaks to the issues of the day? We're depending on you to speak up. Mm. Mm, I like that challenge. Mm -hmm. So today I've been speaking with Larry Garrity. I've really, really enjoyed our conversation. Or um, I hope to have you back again. Uh, please don't say no publicly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've really enjoyed our conversation. If, if uh, people are enjoying the content I'm producing, I'd love a little bit of uh, support there. You can go to paypal.me forward slash Peter Dixon Music. I often think I need to drop the word music. It's mainly um, Peter Dixon interviews now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also, if you're interested in in my music, talking about the past life I had as a musician, although I still do music at least three times a month, gigs still are going. Uh, yeah. But you can go and find my album, Standing at the Cross, there on Spotify and listen to for free as well. So... Yeah, just final thoughts there for us, Larry, with um, I guess this notion of, you know, you came out of Glacier View, you and Fritz spent some time thinking, can we actually be Adventists? Mm -hmm. A, what would it look have looked like if you'd both left the church? What would you have done for the next, for these last 43 years? What would you have done if you'd left the Adventist church? Uh, and then just close with offering people hope of mm. how how the Adventist Church can come out of this wilderness that it seems to have re-entered in lately. You know, I remember um, it was in the interview that the two of us had with you uh, when Fritz said, you know, that uh, I love the church. I've uh, it's been a good ride. Um, I'm an Adventist through and through. I've had no other employer than the Adventist Church, uh, and uh, I'm full of hope that that uh, things are getting better, and uh, he he ended in a very positive sort of testimony, you know. And I would say the same thing. I've had no other employ employer but the Adventist Church. The the Adventist Church has given me um, all the opportunities that I've had, and so it's uh, it's made me, you know. Um, it sent me off to school given me uh, wonderful travel opportunities around the world. I've taught in many places, written many things. And so I'm, I'm who I am, I'm indebted to the church. That's not to say that I haven't made my mistakes and I've let, let the church down, I'm sure, on numerous occasions. But um, for me, the church has been a, a good employer, a challenging group, to work with and given me uh, a lot of satisfaction in life. And I've been privileged to be there at times that really counted, you know, at the time when women's ministry began in terms of ordination, um, when the church recognized the such things as, as kinship and uh, homosexuals, what to do about them in the church, uh, Fritz and I were both there at the first camp, kinship camp meeting. Uh, been there when the uh, doctrines were written up with the fundamental beliefs. Uh, I could list many, many uh, events, conferences, issues where I've been there from the start. So it's been an interesting life. And so I, I thank the church for that. And I long for a church that will do that for everyone who wants to be involved. No, no matter what their background, 
what their issues are. If they want to be a part, if they feel call, God has called them into this community, let's utilize them. Let's give them a place. Let's let's educate them. Let's send them on errands and let's learn from them because we cannot afford to to miss any talent that's out there that wants to be involved. So uh, um, I'm I'm optimistic about the church's future because God is at its head. Larry Garrity, we'll leave it there for today. Thank you so much for coming on the program and we wish you well and we look forward to catching up again. Oh, one last quick thing. Uh -huh. Every Sabbath, you guys have a kind of a Sabbath school program that Fritz would often speak at. I think you even right. changed the name of it. We did, to Fritz Guy and Friends Sabbath School, yeah. And mm -hmm. is that open to the public? It is, it is. So, and, um, uh, how do people find it? Because I'd love to send people there. I, I will send you the uh, the uh, information awesome. that you can share. Yeah, and I'll put awesome. it in the group. Yeah, very good. Until next time, Larry Garrity, see you later. Thank you.